Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found... the studios of Blackwater Media in the city of Atlanta. Welcome to another episode of the Shadowland Radio Show. I'm your host, Dr. William Lester, and I'd like to welcome you and, and thank you for tuning in to another installment of the program. As always, I'd like to thank all of you who have become uh, listeners and subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is Blackwater Media. If you go to YouTube and type in Shadowland Radio Show in the search engine, we'll come up and you can scroll down and look at all of the archived episodes and listen to past episodes, recent episodes, preview upcoming episodes, and so forth. We're also available uh, for listening on uh, Facebook. If you type in Shadowland Radio Show on Facebook, our page will come up, and just like on YouTube, you can listen to all of the archived episodes. We're available on Google Plus as well. And finally, at ShadowlandRadioShow.com. Go to that website, click on the Episodes tab, and it takes you to all of the archives. So it's really 24 hours a day on demand for the show. On today's program, we are actually continuing a conversation uh, that we have been having with one Frank Fischino, who has authored the Braxton County Monster, as well as a book called Shoot Them Down. Uh, but the discussion has been about an incredible wave of UFO activity and close encounter incidents during 1952. So we're going to pick that back up again today uh, with Frank. Are you there? Yes. Glad to be back. Absolutely glad to have you back. There's so many parts to this saga. There's so many different elements, so many twists and turns, and we covered a lot of them in our earlier shows, but we, we definitely want to pick back up. And there, there's uh, an incident that I know that you wanted to uh, get into at some point uh, about, uh, uh, the, we refer to it as Frame Town, and there's the incident at Strange Creek, but I wanted you to be able to get back uh, with the audience and uh, pick up with this amazing story, taking us back to the year 1952 and an unprecedented wave of UFO activity that was going on. So I'll let you take it from that point. Okay. Um, where we left off at the last show, we were in Frametown, West Virginia, which is the geographical center point of West Virginia. And we had the Flatwoods Monster encounter between Mrs. May and the monster and the group of Flatwoods boys ranged in various ranges as we spoke about earlier well after that incident happened Dr. Lester uh, there's something I want to jump into real quick here okay. the West Virginia National Guard 
was actual con was actually contacted that night. Uh, Mrs. May had called up the local police department, and uh, it went through a hierarchy through the state police, and this call eventually somehow went to Washington D.C. Well, Colonel Levitt was um, a World War II veteran, and he had come back after the war, and he eventually became the commander of the Guard. And he received a call from uh, Washington. He said the Air Force had contacted him and gave him two different points to go to in Braxton County. Um, basically, it was, uh, it was a search mission. And I spoke to Colonel Levitt a couple different times, and I eventually... Um, persuaded him to talk about what happened. He he wasn't too uh, enthusiastic at the beginning about talking about this whole thing. He told me a little bit here and there, but in the long run, after some time, I eventually took a camera and I went up onto this site and I actually interviewed Colonel Levitt. And uh, to, in a nutshell, he was called by Washington and he was told to go to two areas one where there was a crash of a UFO along uh, the Elk River a few miles outside of Flatwoods and the other point where he was told to go search was the actual Bailey Fisher farm where the Flatwoods monster incident occurred and I walked through Colonel Levitt through all the different points where the story had occurred and uh, Levitt told me that he was up there with approximately 50 troops in Flatwoods. The other troops had went down to the Elk River of what was said to be a crashed airplane, and there was never an airplane found. It was actually a different craft that touched down there. Well, Levitt was on the farm. He set his troops up, and then he went back to the other crash site. Well, while he was up there, he gathered different samples, and uh, I go into explicit detail in my book about um, this interview, but he said he had about 50 people there, and they actually stayed the night. And during the interview, Dr. Lesser, that kind of really took me back. I'm like, what? He says, yeah, my troops stayed up here uh, for the night. He says, in case something else was going to happen. So the Air Force knew this was something serious. They didn't send the West Virginia National Guard throughout specific points in Braxton County because it was an owl in a tree, because that was the official explanation. It was probably an owl in a tree and uh, all that bogus type of cover-up explanations. But Colonel Levitt was real sincere with me, and I interviewed him up on the farm for approximately about one hour. And... Um, the one thing that was interesting about Colonel Levitt's interview, I actually interviewed him early on at the beginning of my investigation. And because I had this taped over the next few years when I would interview other people, um, I understood fully the whole scope of what had happened. Because he told me a lot of stuff, Dr. Lester, I had no idea what he was talking about. Right. You know, and then as I started getting the Project Blue Book documents out and I started going through stuff, piecing this together for the next about 20 years, um, I kept pulling the tape out and going over stuff what Levitt had told me. But in the end, uh, Colonel Levitt told me he said something was a cover-up. He knew there was a cover-up there. And uh, so what happened from that point is Colonel Levitt's troops stayed there overnight and Colonel Levitt went back down to the other area along the Sugar Creek uh, section of Braxton County where this other craft had went down. And the troops left in the morning, everybody scattered. It was basically a covert mission. What I couldn't understand at the beginning is how Levitt and his troops with 50 men got up onto the farm through the access road in Flatwoods without being seen. Well, when we walked onto the farm during the taped interview, he actually pointed out and showed me the area where his troops came in. They actually came into a back logging road not to draw attention to them, which was a really key part of the story because myself or nobody else understood that. And most people around town didn't even know that Levitt was there because it was a covert mission. So what happened is... Uh, 
the Flatwoods Monster incident actually occurred about 8 p.m. that night. Um, it landed at about 7.25 p.m., okay? And it was on the ground for nearly an hour. And somewhere just before 8.30, the craft took back off with the being in it, the occupant, and I was able to track it through Braxton County. And what's interesting is it actually followed um, Route 4 and the Yolk River. Um, as I said in the last show, when I was talking with Friedman, and we were going over the maps, it was interesting to see that it was actually following the cut of the of the land and the terrain. It was following roads. It was following rivers, not to go up and down and with the chances of crashing into a mountain. So what happened is this craft actually traveled along the Elk River, and it flew approximately 17 miles and headed southwest, and it crashed into an area that's called uh, James Knob. It was up in the mountains of Frametown. Right. And when it touched down there, it was seen by several different uh, local residents. And um, actually, when we did our, um, a few years ago, our Monster Quest episode, they covered this aspect of the story. And we actually shot the um, episode from James Knob. So if you see that, we were actually on that mountaintop in that vicinity where that craft went down. Well... What happened is it was seen on uh, crashing into that, making like a crash landing in another cleared area. And that was approximately 8.30 that night. And everything was, was quiet, and there were no more sightings from that point on until the following night. And that is the story we're going to get into. That was actually the Frame Town Monster sighting. And what happened with that incident, it involved um, a fellow, his name was George Natalski, he was with his wife Edith, and they were from Ohio, they were in Ohio on vacation, they were heading back to New York where they lived. And they were coming through Braxton County the following night, and it was approximately 8 p.m. Well, Snitowski, uh was driving through the mountains, they were basically sightseeing, heading back to Queens, New York. And you have to remember that there was no interstate in that area. So basically, there was um, the main roads were secondary roads as they are today. And they were going through the mountains in Frametown. And Snitowski had um, noticed that he had his window down. As he was driving along through Frametown, he, uh, something was smell, smelled really bad. It was like a sulfur and a gaseous smell, and he th actually thought there was a chemical plant in the area that was on fire. Well, what happened is the car stalled alongside of the road. And uh, this is about dusk, approximately 24 hours after the monster sighting, about 8 p.m. Okay, they're about 17 miles away from where Flatwoods is. And they had no idea what had happened in Flatwoods because it hadn't hit the press. And that's an important part here. The story didn't hit until a couple of days later. Okay. So here he is. His car is over on the side of the road. And uh, he looks off to the side into the woods. And there was this dazzling flash of light. And it was wavering. And it was like an unsteady being. So uh, he didn't know what was going on, and the whole area becomes engulfed with this sulfurous smell. As he's looking out into the distance, this uh, craft is like an, an oval shape, and it's set way back in the woods. He's not down on the side of the road, and he's trying to figure out what the heck is going on with this thing. And he said this this thing that was sitting out in the woods looked like a frosted street lamp except a couple hundred times bigger and he said it was slightly rocking back and forth it was actually hovering right. and uh, so what he did is he jumped out of the car and he's trying to uh, get the car started and uh, he thought maybe the battery cable something had happened but it, you know uh, it was basically a, a newer battery, so it was kind of uh, weird out of the middle of nowhere just for your car to stall in the area where, where UFO is. 
and I eventually found out that's kind of common, and there's been thousands of cases like it. So anyway, Snitowski is looking at this thing, and uh, he said it was about two or 300 feet away out in the distance. And uh, as it's rocking back and forth, he's looking at it, and um, he starts walking towards it, okay? And as he's getting closer to it, he said that he felt a tingling sensation going through his body. <coughs> Excuse me. His wife is back at the car, and they have a baby. And the baby is about 18 months old. And... I'm trying to set the scene here, Dr. Lester, because there was no baby car seats back in that day. Right. What they would actually do is they had miniature cribs, and the cars in the 50s were gigantic. The interiors were large. There was a baby crib that was situated and fastened into the back of the car, and that's where they actually would keep the kid while they were traveling. The wife is sitting in the front seat as a passenger, and because the car wouldn't start back up again, Snitowski's looking at this thing, and his wife is sitting back in the car watching this whole thing go on, and the baby's in the crib. So it's starting to get darker, and she's starting to panic, and because they're stuck out in the middle of the mountains here, and there's something hovering out in the distance. Snitowski is walking towards this thing, and as he started getting closer to it, he said he felt thousands of needle-like vibrations, and the, it was like a low-grade electrical shock. It was like needles and pins were stabbing him as he approached this thing. And uh, he started getting sick from that, compounded with there was a sulfur smell in the air. And um, he started uh, vomiting. And he's backing away from this thing, and he actually went down on his knee, and he was bracing himself up against a tree, and he's vomiting profusely all over the place. Wow. And uh, just about at this time, as he's trying to get his equilibrium back together, he's starting to move back towards the car, and uh, his wife starts screaming. I mean, um, I spoke to George on the phone years ago, and I found out about this story. And he basically verified, I'm just going to throw this in for the record, okay. he verified that everything that was released in an article in 1955, it was written by Paul Lieb in Mail Magazine, he said was exactly the truth. There was no um, exaggeration, and it was what I had read of the original magazine from 1955. He said what he told Paul Lieb was the truth. So we talked for a bit, and um, I'm going to tell you what happened now at this point. He's walking back towards the car, and his wife, Edith, is like, uh, I've said this before, she was like Fay Ray when she saw King Kong. <laughs> she was screaming like a banshee. She was goddamn hysterical. George's equilibrium is off. He's gathering the senses. He's walking back towards the car, towards the towards the road, and she's pointing and screaming to look behind them. And he's screaming, her, oh, eat it, for God's sake, what the hell's the matter? And she's basically paralyzed with fear, and she's pointing at him. And she's pointing up behind him. She's sitting in the car, and she's going nuts. Now the baby starts crying because of all of the commotion. The whole air is filled with this sickening sulfur smell. So now it's starting to turn into pandemonium. He turns around to see what the hell she's pointing at, and he said that what he saw buckled his knees. He almost keeled over just right at that point. What he saw was out at the end of the road, there was a figure standing there, and it was a mobile right at the edge, and he said it was about 30 or so feet off to his right, and it was silhouetted by the, the backlight from this fear that's floating out there. And this thing starts moving towards him. And as it's moving towards him, he got a good look at it. And he said it was about a good eight or nine feet tall. And it was in the general shape of a man. And he said the body looked bloated. And it had big, long, spindly arms. So he didn't hang around too long, needless to say, to check this thing out or see what it wanted. But it started hovering towards him, Dr. Lester, and he freaked out. 
his wife's screaming, the baby's going hysterical, and the whole area is filling up with this this sulfur type smell. Does this sound familiar? Oh, absolutely. The sulfur smell. <laughs> okay. So he runs back to the car. He's flipping out. He said that he fumbled with the car door handle, and then he finally climbed in, and he slammed the door. Okay. Now he's freaking out because the baby's going crazier, and he's yelling at his wife to muffle a baby's mouth. You know, and and he said she was whimpering in sheer terror. That's an exact quote. So what he does is he takes his wife, she grabs the baby, pulls the baby over onto her lap, and the husband, which is a natural instinct with his family, he takes them, and you could do this in a big old 50s car, he basically pushed them down on the front passenger side of the car floor. He reached in and he grabbed out a big hunting knife. It was like a big butcher knife. Right. Okay. He had, didn't have a piece on him. So he slams the glove box and he's laying on top of him. And he said he was down there for several minutes. Now, he's freaked out too. He's laying on top of the baby and his wife hovering over him. And he's holding on to this butcher knife. And this thing is heading towards the car, and he's in terror, too. He doesn't know what the hell's going on, what this thing's going to do, if it's if it's hostile. And it comes towards the car. And what it actually did is it came towards the car, and it circled around it. Now, the whole area is filling up with this sulfur smell. And he was scared to look up. Well... The scary part of what happened here at this point, he finally looked up after a few minutes to see where the hell this thing was, and when he picked his head up above, and now he's basically sitting behind the wheel of the the driver's uh, side, he looks up, and the damn thing is looking straight down at him, and it's at the hood of the car. Oh, my goodness. And this thing is about nine feet tall. Now... The point here where he got a good look at this thing, it was basically uh, reptilian looking. What George Natowski saw and his wife, they actually saw the spacesuit upper portion removed, okay? As I said in the last show, what the Flatwoods monster actually was, it was a mechanical type hovercraft. And what Snitowski saw from the waist up was this big bloated body. This thing was about nine foot tall. That was his quote, a good nine foot tall. And it had this big giant head, and it basically looked like some type of a reptilian or snake. Okay? And this was from my conversation with him. The arms were very out of proportion. And where he noticed the hand area, what happened is this thing is looking down at him, and it actually reached down with one of its arms, and it's, he saw the hand up close, and it reached down, and it touched the hood of the car. And when he, it touched the hood of the car, he saw it only had two fingers. It didn't have five digits. It only had two. And he's staring paralyzed at this thing. It's looking down at him. And he laid back down over his wife, and this thing is hovering around the area. And he doesn't know what the hell, what's going on. And um, after it reached down, um, I'm going to give you a quote, for, actually from George Santowski, what he said. Reaching across the windshield from above, a long spindly arm was forked into two soft ends. It seemed to be examining the surface of the car. And then he goes on to say, if I ever prayed in my life, I was praying then. Then he goes on to say, seconds later, without making any hostile moves towards this, the creature started back to the woods. Creature's a key word there. This thing wasn't um, uh, robotic or it wasn't, you know, a machine. It was something contained in a machine. And... What he said, the lower torso was a single solid mass that seemed to glide across the the uneven road surface. So what we have here by looking, um, 
looking at all the descriptions and piecing this together and being an illustrator and, and talking to these people and meeting with the Flatwoods people and doing these renderings, I went, my God, I said, this is the same thing that they saw the night before except the upper portion of it was off. And if you remember, Freddie May and the different witnesses uh, talked about how this thing was a machine. It was mechanical, and Freddie told me that he believed something was in it because this thing reacted to the Flatwoods people the night before so now we have this encounter 24 hours later and what I was able to do and you can see some of the illustrations in my book and there's some of them that are online um, I actually took the nine foot tall figure that Statowski told me about which is documented and I did cutaways and I figured out the dimensions, how big it was, to what Snotowski said, what Freddie May, what Mrs. May and the witnesses told me. And it was actually from the shoulders down to the waist, there was a seam going around the lower waist area, and that portion was gone. The inner helmet, which was what was described by the Flatwoods witnesses, which had the big giant portholes in there, okay, that was gone, and the upper protective helmet that was on the outside of that inner helmet with the windshield in the front, referenced by Freddie May, all of that was gone. So what we have here is the same being seen 24 hours later in the same area where we're seeing the touchdown, except at this point, half of the, the suit was gone, or protective armor, because it seemed to to be some type of a space crapper or a suit, something. So I want to make sure that the listeners know, uh, the listeners realize that we run a, a visual slideshow uh, uh, for, the, for the broadcast, and they will see illustrations that Frank has done of, of what you're hearing about during this story. Uh, there, there are images of the mechanical uh, uh, apparatus that has been described, but there's also the creature uh, described with the uh, that appears to be inside, you know, from the waist down. From looking at the drawing, from the waist down, which appears to be a some kind of a vehicle, uh, almost like some kind of hovercraft device uh, that uh, is being described. And so, but this, you know, before I spoke to you, Frank, I never uh, heard anything about uh, this creature as a reptilian, uh, which I think is a very interesting thing because we know there's a lot of conversation about reptilian aliens. Uh, in the UFO community, but this is like the first time I've heard this associated to this case. Well, I'm going to jump into another segment of the story from an earlier uh, investigation, uh -huh. and we spoke about this fellow a couple of times, Ivan T. Sanderson. Right. He was one of the first um, people on to the, the location and he did a, an investigation, and he went a little bit deeper. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I want to go into here is what I found out about in uh, this particular Sugar Creek crash, where it's in the area where Colonel Levitt had went down with his troops that night uh, that I mentioned a few minutes ago. There was something that crashed along the Elk River going down towards the Frametown area, which was a different craft. And Ivan Sanderson actually went there. And the information I have here is from two different sections of his works. And I'm going to jump into it because what it involves is something that he found while he was in the Sugar Creek area. He went up there, this was approximately um, about a week after the incident, and he was up there with his assistant, he went with Gray Barker, a fellow called Raymond Walter, and there was another guy uh, from Monsanto Chemical Company, and he um, went into this area where there was a cliff, 
and they actually climbed up this cliff area where this thing was seen to go down. And he said once he got up there, there was a, a little swamp with some trees behind this big forest area where there were taller trees, and he found this gigantic thing that looked like a skid mark, and it had knocked down some of the bushes. Well, and they started going a little bit further into the area. Um, he said that he had looked up, and he noticed that a whole treetop was knocked off, and several branches were shattered. Ooh. And this was just something that had happened recently. And uh, he says, and it looked like there was a hole in the top of the trees, like something crashed through here. Well, what's interesting, Dr. Lesser, is when he got up into that area, he saw gigantic impressions in the ground. And he looked beyond these impressions. Uh, he noticed that something had touched down in this area. And what he noticed around, he said they looked like hook-like impressions. And the way that I, I looked at this thing, it was something heavy had set down and impressed into the earth there. And he said beyond these impressions that were um, like hook-shaped or like semi-circles, he noticed uh, a whole mass of these little pieces of, uh, he said there were little coils of white plastic-like material, and they were scattered all over the ground where something had touched down in this area. Well, he said these pieces look like uh, dried up snake or turtle eggshells. So what they did is they gathered some of this stuff up and he says and it was, you know, it looked like white plastic like material but it looked like it was more of a natural or organic type substance and it wasn't plastic. So he had this stuff analyzed and they gathered it all up and they went down to the Monsanto Chemical Company with it and they were checking it out to see what this thing was. And back then, uh, with my research, I found out that plastics and synthetic fibers uh, were a primary segment of Monsanto's business and during in the 40s and into that area. So Sanderson went down there and they had all of this stuff examined. Well, what he said is... Um, he had uh, spectrograph analysis machines, and they were unable to find out what it was. But they figured out it was something of an organic structure. And he said, uh, and this is a quote, it looked more like the dried up skin of a snake more than anything else. Oh. And he said that, um, I'm going to quote here, he said it proved to have three layers, the outer smooth, the inner layer was rough, the inner uh, portion of the central part was columnar in structure, uh, as far as they could tell. And he says it also contained aragonite, and the whole of it was porous, which would seem to agree with the description of a reptile shell. And uh, this was kind of interesting because this kind of coincides and ties into the description of this thing like looking like a reptilian. So he said, one of these little rolls of stuff, which were only about the size of my little finger when outstretched, measured nine and a half inches long. And he's quoted as saying, I would like to know what snake's egg found in the United States or anywhere else from which you could get a strip nine and a half inches long. And um, he said this on a radio show back in the day. And he ended up closing this portion of the show out. He says, perhaps they were space people, but perhaps they're reptiles and were looking for somewhere to lay an egg. Wow. And so let's tie all of this stuff together uh, from this thing looking like a reptile. Okay. They, they did this analysis on this stuff. God only knows what happened to this stuff or where it went. But... Um, we, you start tying all this stuff together, and it seems that this thing was in some type of a hovercraft, and maybe it was unable to walk. Maybe it didn't have legs, Dr. Lester. Maybe right. that's why it was in this craft, <clears throat> because of that reason. And I work with a lot of Vietnam vets, and um, over the years, Korean vets, 
Uh, but I worked with one particular guy, and, and he brought this point up to me. He said, let's compare the woods of West Virginia to the jungles of Nam. And when I was working with him and plotting the points and trying to put this whole damn story together, he said, you have an E.T. that's uh, down, it's stranded in the woods, uh, the West Virginia National Guard's all over the place looking for it, and the point he, he said to me, he says that, he, and this is an old expression, you can't swing a cat by the tail in the woods of West Virginia without hitting a tree. Right. And it's basically true. What The point he brought up, he said, is, Frank, I can relate to this point, he said, because I was downed, and um, I know what it's like to have the enemy chasing you through the jungle. What you basically would try to do is get out of there, uh, hide, cover yourself up, and make yourself inconspicuous. He said, what I can't figure out with this thing is why this thing was hovering around in its hovercraft, emitting this noxious sulfur smell that you could smell for a mile away when you're trying to hide. Why was it hovering around in that suit? Well, you I would mean, try to a, hide, be the, inconspicuous, yeah. especially when the, the, half of the West Virginia National Guard's out in the county looking for you. And that gets, and, into, uh, that gets into, you know, what it might have been, you know, because we don't know what the circumstances were. This this thing might have been injured, disoriented. Uh, it might have been, uh, what's uh, what's the term? It might have been uh, a fugitive. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we do know that there were other craft that seemed to be searching for something on the ground. Yeah, it was like a search and rescue mission exactly. to grab this so thing, pull them back up. They could have been looking for it. To, so there's a there are a number of situations uh, where you know we just don't know what was going on. Well, to finish this section up, Dr. Lesser, the point I was getting at by talking with this guy, and, and I've talked to a bunch of people about this, is you want to hide, you want to get get into an area where you can tuck yourself away, bury yourself. You don't want to be seen by the enemy. And he said, if you were in that situation, Frank, and the West Virginia National Guard was there, you were just shot down out of the sky. Right. They're hostile. That's their intentions. Are you going to go hovering around in a suit where you could smell the fumes a mile away? Of course you're not. Yeah. And I said, well, what point are you getting at? He says, well, maybe this thing, because well, it was nine foot tall. Maybe it didn't have any legs. And if it was a reptile or some type of a snake, it couldn't get around that fast. Maybe that's why it was using that hovercraft, because it was a necessity. Right. To get around, That's a good point. and that would explain why this thing was seen and drawing attention to itself. And but it wasn't hostile. That's what Zentowski said. It was not hostile. And the story ended up where this um, this being inside the hovercraft it retreated and it went back uh, along the edge of the road and it went back out to the area just off where this thing was sitting at the edge of the woods. And a couple minutes later, Snitowski saw it swinging like a pendulum. Now, a lot of your listeners will probably note this has been seen in uh, hundreds of different sightings where the thing was swinging like a pendulum, the whole craft itself, the oval-shaped craft. And as it built up momentum, he says it took off in a split second. It just disappeared into the sky. Right. And what he did is uh, how car started at this point once the crap. Wow. So he eventually he drove into uh, into back into town uh, into a nearby truck stop, and um, he just gathered himself up and he didn't tell this story uh, for about three years until he spoke to Paul Lieb, and he's the one who wrote that original article up in uh, the Mail Magazine, 1955 incredible aspect of it yeah the the the, the whole you know because I, I i'd seen some of these illustrations uh over the years and i'd seen the the illustration which again looked like a mechanized object 
Mm-hmm. And then I saw this other illustration, which looked like a living creature uh, from the waist up, and then from the waist down, looking like some kind of machine. And I initially thought, well, this is just this is just a different artist giving his interpretation of this. Because sometimes that's what happens in these cases. You have lots of different artists uh, portraying something. And, of course, every artist is going to make it seem a little bit different. Uh, but now we know in this, uh, in this incident that there was a living creature that was seen by eyewitnesses. So that thing was basically on the ground, uh, Dr. Lester, for about 24 hours from the point when it touched down. Now, this brings us into the next story, the Strange Creek story, which you're familiar with this one. Um, What happened is after my book came out, uh, the Braxton County Monster, the updated and revised Uh edition, um, I did a lot of radio shows and... I was talking about this. A lot of people read the book, and a fella from West Virginia had actually got the book as a Christmas present. And he was reading through the book, and next thing I know, this happened last year, and this story was not in my book because the fella read the book, and then he got hold of me. Well, to make a long story short, what had happened is this guy told me when he was a little kid he saw something in the area of where he lived which is Strange Creek. Now Strange Creek is right along the Elk River and um, it's about four miles uh, southwest of Frametown. Okay. Now I've been up in this area researching and doing cutaway shots uh, for, for quite a few years you know, uh, when I put my little documentary together. Well, I'm talking to this guy, and he was really sincere. He um, was retired. He was uh, an electrical worker. He worked on the power lines and stuff up there. Well, he read my story, and he almost fell over because the frame town incident happened just about four miles away from him. And that is the the same vicinity where James Knob, where the thing touched down. Well, what he told me, and I spoke to him about two hours on the phone, and he wanted to see if I had the same outlook as him, because what happened to him just linked completely into the story. And what had happened is it was actually 3 a.m. in the morning at the time of his sighting in Strange Creek, on September 13th. Now, this is just a few hours after Mrs. May sighting. The May sighting was on September 12th, 8 p.m. His sighting in Strange Creek was just a few hours later. Well, he explained the layout of his property and the layout of his house. And just being a kid, uh, he s- told me he was sleeping and something startled him and woke him up. For some reason, He woke up, and he looked out the window of the front of the house. And the way his house is situated, he said there was a long driveway that came off the road, which is the Route 4, and it came up to the the house. His bedroom was on the second floor of the home, and underneath was the entrance to the home. Off to the left-hand side was a carport, and along the right-hand side, looking out the window, was where the woods were. And he said the other side had a fence, and there was a big field, and it was cleared. Well, what happened is he looked out the window, and he saw something he told me was about eight or nine feet tall, and it was hovering and coming up the driveway towards the house. Now, the stories keep getting scarier. (laughs) Him being a little kid saw this thing, he freaked out. And he said he was peering over the the windowsill, checking this thing out, 
And because he worked as uh, an electrician on power lines, he said this thing had a glow to it, and it looked like a machine. And I asked him if he noticed any details about it. Well, he said it was hovering above our gravel driveway. It wasn't tarred. He said it was gravel. He said this thing was coming directly towards the house. And I said, how did you see this thing? He said, that's where the backlight porch was on. Okay? And which, the, you know, you call it the backlight porch. It was actually the back, but the front portion overlooking the driveway. What happened is he said this thing was hovering about a foot off the ground. And as it came towards the house, it started coming into the brighter light. And I said, did you notice the big ace of spades covering over it? And he said, no, the only thing he noticed was a head. Except from the shoulders down, it was a machine. I said, how do you know it was a machine? He said, because it was, it looked like a machine and it was like a steel colored. It was like an aluminum type gray right. color. He said, and it, but it was glowing. It had this like phosphorus glow about it. And I said, how do you know what a phosphorus glow looks like? He says, I worked on power lines my whole life up in the, life in the mountains. I know what <laughs> yeah. this glow looks like. You know, I'm trying to, to, to find out if this guy is full of crap or what the story is with him. So what I was actually doing, I know this area where this happened because I had been up and down that route going up to Frame Town for years. And he said that... Um, this whole area off to one side was an open area. The other side is enclosed. So I got back to talking to him about the locals and the land and the layout. Well, it was kind of wild, Dr. Lester. I was actually trying to trick this guy up, okay. okay, to see if he was full of crap or not. Well, it turned out we knew a lot of the same people. And he actually had dated uh, one of the girls when she was younger, and I knew met her like years later as an adult. And he was giving me the layout of the land. I knew where he was talking about. I was questioning him. So this guy wasn't some total stranger who was just pulling stuff out of the air. He knew the lay of the land, and so did I, because I'd been going up there. It's actually where my cousin's property was and Rain Town just bordering that, that vicinity. And he told me um, this thing, getting back to the story, once we got all of that out of the way, he said as the thing got closer towards the house, he got a better look at it, and he said it had a head, except he didn't notice any inner helmet or outer helmet. He said, but from the shoulders and neck down, he said it looked like my book jacket illustration. And I said to him, I said, wow, I said, this sounds like the Flatwoods monster with the helmet, an inner helmet taken off. And he said, when I was reading your book, Frank, he said, this is why I got so excited about this. I said, how come you never went public with this? Now, this is something I didn't think about at the time, Dr. Lester. He said, what I saw was mechanical and it had a head sticking above the shoulders, but the waist from the, the waist area up, he said there was no body. It was like this thing was encased like a, and like a big giant garbage can and it was flared out. He says, and when we found out later on about the Flatwoods monster and then the drawing was on television, he said, um, the thing that I was telling everybody about, including my parents and all the kids in school and all the locals, they said, well, the thing that was seen at Flatwoods was cloth. What you saw, you must have been hallucinating and dreaming, because it didn't look like that. He says, and what I saw didn't have big arms and claws like what they showed in that stupid picture, so I just wrote the whole damn thing off, and everybody laughed at me, so I stopped talking about this thing, you know, 60 years ago. And I went, oh, my God. I said, this guy was actually right. I said, you did see that thing. I said, because now you see what the book jacket cover looks like and what he actually saw 
was the Flatwoods Monster a few hours afterwards. It had actually traveled through the back area where it touched down in James Knoll. He actually told me the route that he believes it must have traveled, he said, because back up in that area, it isn't just total woods. He said there is hundreds of acres out through that whole area where there's openings and paths and big fields. He said that thing would have had an easy shot to come right up to the house by traveling through the backwoods. So I said, what happened to this thing? Where did it go? He said he watched it coming up towards the house for about 15 or 20 feet. And as it got closer towards the house, he got more scared. He said it was moving slow as it was hovering. And some of the rocks were being blown around because it was a gravel driveway. He said as it got real close towards the house, he panicked and he ducked. And then he rolled over to the side. And that's when he went into his parents' room and he told them he saw some big thing that was hovering up towards the house. And they said, you must be dreaming, you know, go back to bed. And they just blew the story off. But he had told the story for a few years in school but once again, everybody laughed at him, and they said the Flatwoods monster didn't look like that. It had scary arms and claws with a big giant ace of spades thing over its head. And the thing he saw didn't have the ace of spades over its head. So if we connect all these stories, when this thing was seen in Flatwoods, it was seen in the full suit. When it landed in James Knoll, it was... Uh, about, a, I don't know, about 8.30 or so, it touched down over there. So from 8.30 until about 3 o'clock, this thing must have or obviously got out of its craft. And from James Knoll to the area where he told me where his house is, which I know where it is, he said is about two and a half to three miles through the mountains there. So that thing traveled over a few hours after it touched down into the Strange Creek area. Then after he saw it, and he said it must have went by the carport area and back out into the field. And then the following, uh, the same evening, because this is 3 a.m. Right. the 13th, the Snotowski incident happened, and Snotowski saw the thing with the upper portion off. So we have three different sightings, Dr. Lester, and every sighting, it looked different, and a different piece of the suit was taken off. Wow, so uh, it, it, it's just an incredible story. And it, and it, you know, it's interesting because when, when you compare it to, say, for example, Roswell, so many mm -hmm. more people know about Roswell, but there seems to be, with this story, there's more pieces, there's more parts, there's more angles, there's more to it, there's more going on. And there's, and there's more, more evidence. evidence. And it is a few years more recent, right? And so it... it yeah, 52 yes, and 47. It's a couple of years earlier, a couple of years later, I mean, so, you know, it's interesting how you say Roswell, and even a lot of people who aren't that into UFO uh, things uh, will have heard of it. You talk about Braxton County, Flatwoods, and people say, well, no, I've never heard of that. And uh, I wonder why that is. Is it just not gotten the level of attention in the media, or... Well, the whole thing got written off and it became a joke when the government uh, released the, the information and Donald Keogh spoke to uh, Albert Chop and they gave the explanation of this thing was probably an owl in the tree. Uh, the, the kids and Mrs. May and everybody got sick from the gases and everything they inhaled. All of that was brought on by uh, mass hysteria and they were frightened. And uh, what else they said is all the marks and the trails and the landing sites 
where the thing touched down at Flatwoods before Mrs. May and the kids saw it. All of that trace evidence was from the first villagers, quote, unquote, who went up there and trampled it down. So I guess all the villagers ran up there and they made those big gigantic oh, sure. marks, single file back and forth, then they all ran in uh, damn circles to get the, the pattern of what the thing where it touched down. Happened, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and then it just became a folklore, and uh, it was covered up very well. It was covered up very well. And Mrs. May talked to me in one of her interviews about the guys who came in from Washington, D.C. Uh, at first, they posed as newspaper reporters, and they uh, they said they were from Clarksburg, which is north of Flatwoods. And they came in, they wanted to do a story in an article, and uh, to make a long story short, because there's about a whole chapter about this in my book, Dr. Lester, uh, they went back and they were very adamant about talking to Mrs. May, and it was like no nonsense. And she kept saying no to them, because like I said earlier, there were hundreds and thousands of people going up the Flatwoods after this happened, and she was just fed up. Her phone was ringing off the hook, people banging on her door 24 hours a day, reporters. And finally, she told me that they uh, said they were from uh, Washington and they were investigating this. And that was never released publicly, except Major Donald Keogh, the UFO pioneer, had researched and he was contacting Washington. And he wanted to know what was going on. And Keogh said in one of his books that he had heard that there were newspaper reporters that went up to Flatwoods on a covert mission undercover to find out what happened there. Well, what happened is Mrs. May went up onto the farm with these two guys. And when she told me this, Dr. Lester, I was actually at her, uh, her apartment in Gasaway, West Virginia. And I was sitting there in her living room and we're talking about this. And she said these guys had on fancy yeah. suits and they were dressed to the teeth, and uh, they wanted the oil from Mrs. May's uh, beautician uniform. And they wanted to know a little bit more about this whole thing. So Mrs. May and Freddie accompanied them from the home, and they went up onto the Fisher farm. And they wanted Mrs. May to point out where it was seen and this and that. Well, make a long story short, Mrs. May said that she pointed up to the area of the tree where this thing was seen, where it was leaking oil and shooting oil all over the place. Well, she said, and this was kind of funny, she was sitting in a big easy chair, and I'm sitting there with bated breath listening to the story for the first time, you know, and it's like, wow, this is awesome. She's finally explaining what happened. She said, one of the guys went up behind the tree and he ducked off of the path and he started walking through the woods where all the oil was splattering all over the place. And she started laughing and she says that when he came back, he looked like a zebra. And I says, what do you mean, Mrs. May, a zebra? She says, well, that nice suit that he had on was covered in oil that had splattered and hit up on the branches and he was walking through it. And when he came back, his whole uh, outfit was ruined <laughs> because all the branches he was walking through, all this oil had splattered hot to it. And she says he looked like a striped zebra. And he stood there, and he looked at the other guy, and Freddie May was standing there in the field, and he looked at his uh, partner, and Mrs. May said to me, and she was very adamant about this, and she remembered this well, Dr. Lester. She said, when he looked at the other guy, she said, I wonder what Ed's going to think when we bring this in for analysis. Now, she said the name Ed stuck with her for all of those years, and I almost fell out of the chair I was sitting in when I was taping her. This was a tape recorder conversation. Uh, because in 1952, the head of Project Blue Book was Captain Edward wow. Ruppel. And he was in charge of Project Blue Book. And 
I told Mrs. May that later on, you know, after our conversation, she says, I never did know who Ed was. And I says, well, is it just a coincidence? It was Edward Rupel who was in charge of Blue Book at the time. And what they did is they went from that point in the farm and they went back to the house and they took out some type of a tool and they scraped the oil out of Mrs. May's uniform. And they uh, they stuck it in some type of an envelope and uh, she said she had the uniform. They didn't take it, but they scraped the oil out of it. They took the evidence out of it. And they spoke to her for a little while, and they just took off. They were taking notes and jobs. Well, they couldn't have down. taken. They couldn't have but taken all of the oil out from her uniform. She said it was stained, yeah. but where it was clumped up, she had just taken it off on the night before, and basically just dropped it. She hadn't even washed it, and 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 I was very adamant about what happened to it. What did you do with it? And she says, Frank, she says it was stained. They scraped it out of the, the fibers of the cloth <laughs> with some little tool. And I said, so what did you do with it, Mrs. May? She said, Frank, I threw the damn uh. thing out. She says the stains wouldn't come out. The, the stains never would come out of that uniform. It was basically ruined because she got hit point blank. Remember, she was. she said the length of a yeah. small car. So the whole front of this uniform was was covered in this gooky stuff and uh, this oil that was leaking and spewing out from the monster. And she says, I kept it in a vent. I just said, what am I going to do with this thing? And she says, I threw it in the garbage because it was just soiled and trashed. <laughs> wow. Can you imagine, can you imagine yes. what a piece of evidence that is? Yeah. Yeah, but she didn't think anything of it. Back then, it was this, ah, I can't wear this one to work. Because that's what she told me back in the day. They used to wear uniforms. She was a beautician. And they had a little hat, and they had their uniform. And she said it was beige. And she says because the oil was a little bit darker in color, uh, it just ruined it. But they scraped the oil, the, the clumps of it out, you know, the, the majority of it. So that was another point where I started saying to myself, this thing was a machine. You know, the, the, it's some type of a hovercraft space suit. You know, you have your oil, the um, the exhaust, the emissions, uh, the different points. Like the Sintowski incident, we have the sulfur smell where Sintowski said that it was uh, it was hovering and gliding across the road. It had that terrible smell. Same thing like what happened with Mrs. May and the kids. You know, th there's a definite connection there. And then we have the other fellow who called me up who saw this thing a few hours after the incident, except he saw the helmet part was gone off of it. He says, I did not see the helmet or that big ace of spades thing over it. He said it was close enough to the house where um, he got a good look at it. And he said it was glowing like an aura. So I think what we have here, Dr. Lester is the same being seen throughout Braxton County over a 24-hour period. Yeah, it's a remarkable story, and it's just, it, it's an incredible e event, uh, you know, West Virginia 1952, again, which is which is really a, a, a part of a larger UFO wave uh, that occurred that year. So what, what we're going to do, because there, there are still... There are many, many parts to this that we haven't even touched on. There, there is a, there's a, a more involved military aspect of this, uh, not just uh, restricted to uh, pilots uh, firing and shooting at these uh, UFOs, but there's also a part of this dealing with uh, pilots who went missing after engaging with these UFOs so that it's a whole other area that we need to get into and as 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 you learned in earlier shows you know uh, Frank has agreed to you know talk with us in a series of, of discussions about this incredible event so we're going to wrap up uh, this episode but we will definitely we're, we're, we're by no means finished with this so uh, you'll be hearing uh, Mr. Fashino uh, continue to talk about 
uh, this incredible series of events. Uh, uh, Frank, would you tell everybody uh, how they can get your books? Well, the easiest way to get my book, Dr. Lester, is to go on to flatwoodsmonster.com. You could read uh, my updated uh, different reviews, and then you can order the book directly okay. from there. And you just a button that you click on, and it will bring you straight to the the site, and then you can order the book. The Shoot 'Em Down book is there as well. And uh, just be prepared to hold on to your hat because between two of those books, there's a lot of information. Right. Yeah. So yeah, please please pick the books up because I think that between the books and this series of shows, you're just gonna. This is gonna be the best source of information. Uh, on the Flatwoods incident. Uh, so definitely do that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another edition of the Shadowland Radio Show. I want to thank my guest, Frank Fraschino. And of course, like I said, he will be back. I want to remind you that you can hear the show on uh, Facebook. Uh, if you just type in our name, uh, Shadowland Radio Show. And uh, that page will come up. You can listen to us on Google+. Plus. You can listen to us on YouTube and also at ShadowlandRadio.com. That's going to do it. I am your host, Dr. William Lester, coming to you from the city of Atlanta, Blackwater Media Studios. Until next time, don't flip out. Don't panic. Don't worry. I promise I will see each and every one of you again on the flip side.